Corporate Structures and Ownership. This is the first learning module within Corporate Issuers. We're going to cover this learning module in three videos. The first one will cover the introduction and business structures. The second one is going to cover the difference between public and private corporations. And the third one is going to cover the difference between lenders and owners. So as discussed, the first video will cover the difference in uh, what are the different forms of business structures? The first one being a sole proprietorship, second, general partnership, third, limited partnerships, and fourth, a corporation. And the main focus will be corporations. Then in the second video, we're going to talk about the differences between private and public corporations and how do you go from a private to public, so going public basically. And uh, sometimes you even go from public to private. And we will talk a little bit about that as well. And what is the life of a corporation? Like a baby is born and grows up and then becomes old. A company is also born and grows and then becomes old. So we'll talk about that life cycle. Then in the third video, we're going to talk about the difference between bonds and stocks or debt securities and equity securities. So the differences between these two securities in terms of their risk and return profiles and what are the conflicts that can arise between the holders of these two different type of securities. So let's get started with the business structures. Now we're going to look at four different types of business structures, but our main focus will be on corporations. And how are we going to study the differences in these four different types of business structures. Number one, we're going to look at how the legal relationship between the owner of the company is with the company itself. So for example, the sole proprietorship is the same. There is no legal difference between the owner and the business because they are one and the same, right? And therefore there is no owner operator separation as well because they are the same. But when we talk about a corporation, it is a separate legal entity. The company is a complete separate legal entity. It is actually like a person. And the owners are separate natural persons as well, right? Then we will talk about business liability with respect to how much the owners are liable for the actions of the business. So if the business, uh, if there's something horribly wrong that goes on in the business, does it come back to the owners? So in the case of a sole proprietorship, since they are one in the same, so then definitely it will be coming back to the owners, but not in the case of a corporation. And this is the difference that we will be talking about. Uh, in terms of a taxation, all three of these are taxed at the individual owner level. That whatever the business income is given to the owner or the partner in the business, they have to pay a personal tax on it. But with a corporation, what happens is, and we, again, we are going to discuss this in detail, is that first the corporation has to pay a corporate tax and then uh, after the corporation pays a corporate tax, then it gives dividends to its owners or shareholders and then they have to pay an income tax again on that dividend, right? So there is a double tax over here, which is a problem, but there are a lot of advantages of corporations that I will tell you about. And we will also emphasize on the fact that those advantages weigh uh, the uh, are what much more than the, this disadvantage of double tax. And we will talk about that when we come to corporations. But first, let's get started with the simplest, most basic type of business structure, the sole proprietorship. Now, the sole proprietorship is the same as the individual because the individual not only provides capital for it, but also controls the business operation. And in return, if anything goes wrong in that business, the individual is liable for it without a limit. There is unlimited liability, right? And this individual personally funds the business, retains full control of the business, 
And whereas that might sound very good because, I mean, you don't really have to take orders from anyone. You don't have to uh, ask for money from anyone. It's your money. It's your business. You're in control. Um, and this is very well suited for a small business like a family owned store. Uh, but when the business grows, then you, you might want to reconsider the structure, especially because number one, it has unlimited liability. Number two, uh, you might need more capital, right? So what do you do if you need more capital? And number three, you might need more expertise in terms of managers or maybe even partners to help you grow the business, right? So the next step is that you might consider all the different uh, situations that you are going to face because even though you might prefer this uh, sole proprietorship because of its simplicity but that is okay for a small scale scale business and it also gives you a lot of flexibility to take quick decisions but if you want to grow then number one this business is constrained by your own capital right and your ability to assume risk so if you want to grow the business you need access to capital then then there are other sources um, of capital that you can consider but then you might need to let go of this control which we will talk about next when we get to the general partnership but just before we go on to the general partnership i want to talk about the sole proprietorships each of those four points which we outlined in the very beginning of this video that we want to see all four of these for each of the business structures now for the first business structure which is sole proprietorship as far as legal relationship is concerned there is no difference between the owner and the business the owner is the business and the business is the owner it is an extension of the owner so therefore the business has no legal identity no separate legal identity it is considered an ex extension of the owner itself number one number two there is absolutely no delegation in control so who has full control the owner has full control of the business so there is no separation between ownership and operation right which you will see is slowly going to start coming in and by the time we reach to the corporation which is the fourth business structure we will discuss there will be a complete separation of ownership and operation and that you will begin to realize that could be a very very good thing if the business is very very large right but again for a small scale business this owner operation uh, relationship uh, gives you full control and against that it gives you simplicity and flexibility so pros and cons trade-off is there uh, depends on the size of the business then let's talk about liability so again if it's a small business and you're really keeping your eye on everything maybe it's a shop or something like that where you're there all the time and you open the shop and until you close the shop so then maybe you can afford to take all that risk but if you have a big business with multiple offices across the world then obviously you don't want to retain all the risk associated with this business because you can be and will be financially responsible if anything goes wrong right so if you if your business takes a loan from someone and is not able to give that loan back then guess who has to give that loan back the owner has to give that loan back because there is no separation between the owner and the business the good thing and this is the only good point here even after the big business becomes big that they are only taxed once so the business doesn't have to pay any corporate tax the business just declares the income and gives it to the owner and the owner just pays a tax on that personal income once so this kind of business structure is taxed only once and so is the general partnership and the limited partnership which are the other two structures we will discuss but the corporation the fourth one when we will we'll get to that that unfortunately is taxed twice anyways let's move on from the sole proprietorship to the general partnership now basically what's happening is that you have other people coming in with you and the biggest advantage of that is they can bring money and not just money they can bring expertise right so we're talking about additional resources coming into the business they help take a load off your shoulders they can share the risk 
they can put in more money they can put in they can help you manage the business in terms of the expertise so this is good and you can outline whatever agreement you have with them in terms of roles and responsibilities in something called the partnership agreement now what happens here you are alone now you've got two or more people with you to help you control the business and even provide capital to it because you might have run out of money or you might have run out of time so they can come in and help you with number one capital and number two expertise but still this business has unlimited liability there is the business still does not have a separate legal entity the owners are the same as the business and if anything goes wrong over here it comes back to the partners who are personally liable for the business right so there is still no legal entity of the business and the partners are the representative of the business as per the partnership agreement that who is responsible for how much and there is still no separation between owners and operators right so no separation between owners and operators it is a partner or owner operated business they still share the risk and the liability uh, there is no separate legal entity for the company so therefore anything goes wrong in the company you will have to the partners will have to pay for it and of course they get the return of it as well right so the risk and return all lies with the partners and they will be paying taxes as personal income so again only taxed once at the personal level the business doesn't have to pay tax the business will give the return to the partners in terms of the profits and they will pay a tax on their personal income however still there is a limitation uh, because they are contributing capital and expertise themselves therefore the business growth is limited to the amount of capital and expertise they can provide and the amount of risk they can assume right because they have a limited ability to provide capital they have a limited ability to provide expertise and they have a limited amount of risk appetite so therefore for the business to further grow now let's look at the other two remaining structures the limited partnership and the corporation but first let's talk about the limited partnership so here what happens is before we had gen all general partners but now what we say is okay one person is more involved in the running of the business and the others are less involved right so if the others are less involved then if something goes wrong it's not really their fault if something went wrong right so therefore they should have a limited liability which means that they should only lose up to the amount of their investment and this person the general partner this person should have unlimited liability if something goes horribly wrong because they are the ones more active so they are more active and therefore more responsible right uh, the limited partners are providing money they're probably busy in their lives and other things so they have limited liability which means the worst thing that can happen to them is they can lose all the money that they have put in but nothing more so their personal assets are separate from the business and therefore protected from the liabilities of the business so if something horribly goes wrong in the business you should not go after you cannot go after the personal assets of the limited partners because they have limited liability now however they still have a claim on the profits so the all partners have a entitlement to the share of the profits but because the general partners are taking a higher risk they are taking a higher risk therefore definitely they should get a higher return right a larger portion of their of the business's profits because they are taking the responsibility for it now here you can see the see the general partner is there and the limited partner is there general partner is having unlimited liability limited partner is having limited liability general partner controls the business limited partners do not control the business right however still the business is not separate from the owners legally speaking therefore somebody is going to have unlimited liability and that in this case is 
the general partner but this is definitely a step in the right direction because at least now we have some sort of a legal separation uh, to the extent of the limited partners as to, at least that they have limited liability right so this is a step in the right direction but as you will see as we go on to the next business structure which is corporation in which everybody has limited liability so you have a complete separation of ownership and operation but here the general partner is still having unlimited liability and therefore uh, they have a very very high risk now what happens as per the partnership agreement uh, we say which partner gets how much percentage return and this is also taxed once only the corporation is the one that is taxed twice uh, the sole proprietorship the general partnership and the limited partnership they are only taxed once where the profit is given to the individual owners and then they have to pay a tax on their personal income however still the capital and the expertise is being provided by the partners so there is still a cap or a limit on how much the business can grow because the business is limited by the ability financing and risk uh, management and expertise and competence abilities of the partners you can't really say that okay you can go out and get capital from anyone you can go out and hire anyone right because they are the ones who are running the business so their competence their integrity their ability to finance and their ability to take risk is what is limiting the growth of this business that is why we really need to consider going for a corporation because here the capital and expertise is provided by the partners and is limited to what they can personally contribute right and um, the gp is the one who is very very highly exposed so this is what brings us to a corporation and this is the most commonly used structure in the corporate world today where what we have is a complete separation of owners and operators and this even though it's taxed twice but the benefit that you have is you have so much more access to capital and expertise that your corporation can grow from across the country to across the world so you're looking at national multinational conglomerates just because they are having a limited liability this is the corporate veil that we all hear in different contexts that the, the owners are protected from any liability or anything that goes wrong in the company because of this corporate veil that they have limited liability number one and because there is a separation of ownership and uh, operation this leads to a much greater access to capital and expertise that is required and i will emphasize more on that in subsequent slides but before i get into more details of why you get greater access to capital and expertise i just want to talk a little bit about the three main types of corporations which are public for profit private for profit and not non profit of course majority of the corporations in the world are for profit because we are in this to make money right and they can be public once they are listed on a stock exchange or they can be private once they are not of course there are some more uh, detailed criteria of how a company is public and how a company is private and we will get into that but just before we get into for profit organizations and the difference between public and private i just want to talk a little bit about non profit first now non profit corporations they are usually there for some public benefit or religious benefit or some charitable mission right and they they don't pay dividends to their shareholders they don't even pay taxes mostly so generally they don't pay taxes and to be honest they don't really have shareholders per se they have trustees or whoever people are coming together for this cause and uh, some examples like howard university or asian development bank but most of the corporations are for profit and they could be private or 
public so now let's get into what are for profit corporations and how do public and private differ so the main difference between public and private is the number of shareholders right and of course whether they are listed on a stock exchange or not so and this differs from country to country so for example in the uk if you have more than 50 shareholders if you have greater than 50 shareholders then you should be classified as a public now the number of shareholders will classify you as a public but that doesn't necessarily mean you are listed as well right so what you want to be is public as well as listed if you want the greatest amount of access to corporation uh, to capital and expertise right so if you have uh, more than 50 shareholders and you're registered in the uk you will be considered public whether you like it or not in the us the criteria is a little different right where you have to be listed on an exchange for you to be categorized as public and in australia the criteria is different and so on and so forth now in terms of the legal entity here we have this beautiful separation of the owners from the company so the corporation is a legal entity which is separate and distinct from the owners it's like a separate person it's like an individual that individual can get into contracts hire employees borrow money lend money pay taxes it's not a natural person but it is a person it's a legal person right it's a separate legal person and what like for example i am a legal natural person you're a natural person and we have to uh, follow the law wherever we live right so just like that this company which is a legal person also has to follow the law depending on where it lives now where it lives can be where it was registered and or where it is doing business so you maybe you were born in the us but you're doing business in the uk so you have to follow maybe both US and UK laws, right? So if the company is incorporated, let's say in the US, say, but it is doing business in the United Kingdom, then it has to follow both laws. And maybe it is listed, let's say in the Netherlands, in Holland. So then obviously they have to follow the European law as well. So it depends, number one, on wherever you, it was listed, where it was registered or born. Number two, where it is right now doing business. And number three, have they sold securities in any of the stock exchanges in any countries and they have to abide by those laws as well. Again, more emphasis on this beautiful separation between the owners and the operators. And what happens over here is that the owners, since they are separate from the business, how they kind of ensure their control is through something called voting rights which come with the shares that they own so they are attached these voting rights are attached to the shares and they the owners so let's say this is a company and you've got people working inside these com inside this company which is your managers and then you've got these owners so how do the owners kind of make sure that these managers do what is in the best interest of the owners? They use their voting rights and they vote to get the right people on the board of directors. And then those board of directors select these people and make sure they are doing what is best for the shareholders. But there is something which is very important that it is not only shareholders who are stakeholders in the company. There are also other stakeholders such as the employees, which is these guys themselves, right? It could be people providing a loan to this company such as banks or other creditors. It could be the customers of this business who are buying the product or service of this business or it could be the suppliers who are providing products and services to this company or the government or regulators members of the community in which the business is conducting so the society at large so a lot of different stakeholders are there and what we want to do is that um, we want to take care of everyone right and the process of doing that is called corporate governance so there are corporate governance policies and practices that define how to deal with such conflicts if there is going to be a conflict between number one the shareholders number two the management 
and number three the other stakeholders right so if that conflict does happen what will happen and how do you balance in this situation the answer to that lies in the corporate governance policies and practices the beautiful part about this structure is that the owners in the corporation all the owners not just uh, the limited partners but even the general partner so there is no limited partner general partner uh, discrimination or difference over here all the owners have a limited liability so if something horribly wrong goes in the com goes wrong in the company it just cannot go to the owners they have a corporate veil protecting them number one and worst case scenario what they can lose is the maximum amount they have invested in the company not more than that so you can say if this is the value of their investment and let's say they invested a hundred million right worst case scenario it can go down to zero but the best case scenario is it can go to infinity so there is no upside cap but there is a downside limit so it is limited to the downside so we can say there is a limit on the downside but there is absolutely no limit on its upside and which is what we say when which is what we mean when we say they have a residual claim on the net assets once the liabilities have been paid off so let's say you start a company with a hundred million dollars and you get a loan of another hundred million dollars so this is your equity which is what is uh, your own capital and this is the loan which you took from the bank and then and, and then you use this money to set up your business for 200 million and then you invest in some new technology and boom that technology takes your business to 1000 million or a billion now you just have to pay back these guys the 100 million because this is debt so if you're worth 1000 minus 100 now you're worth 900 million dollars right so there is absolutely no cap to what you can make and this is what we mean when we say residual claim that whatever your assets become in this case they are becoming a thousand million and after the liabilities have been paid off which are limited to this hundred million then the rest is yours and therefore you can participate in the growth of this company so it's a very very nice structure and what is really beautiful about this structure it is very easy to get money to finance your business and expand your business and the reason for that is because you've got this separation between ownership and uh, uh, operation so you have now your owners who are separate from your operators and you can go ahead and hire the best people to run your business for you right to fill all these different roles and from a bank's perspective it's very nice to see that you've got professionals managing your business so the bank doesn't really mind providing the capital and even you can get other small owners to come in and provide you little little investment through the stock exchange you can list your uh, shares on the stock exchange so you can get a lot of money from them you can get a lot of money from debt holders and you can get professionals to manage and take your business assets up right so this is you who's setting up this business by providing ownership capital and you can get a lot of small uh, owners through the stock market as well so you can get a lot of money from here and you can go to the bank and you can get money from them through getting loans which is called debt so what you're providing is equity what they're providing is debt and the corporations can raise these two types of capital and this is the preferred business structure because it is very easy to get money uh, when you are a corporation compared to when you are a sole proprietorship or general partnership or a legal uh, uh, limited partnership right i'm not saying it's easy it's just easier compared to those um you know, obviously you need to really know what you're doing with your business plan before you approach the bank or before you go for an ipo because people are not just going to hand you their money you need to have a good plan in place now these are both referred to as investors whether they are buying shares 
or they are buying your bonds or giving you a loan they are both investors in the company's security however the ones who are buying shares will get this unlimited upside which we called the residual claim right however the bondholders have a less risk because if for example let's say you started the company with a hundred million and they came in and gave you a hundred million loan and the assets were initially 200 million and instead of going up to 1000 million let's say it crashed down to a hundred million so what you will now have to do is you'll have to give this hundred million back to the people who gave you debt and you will end up losing all your money and all these smaller investors will end up losing all their money so the equity shareholders they on the upside get a residual claim which could be great if the business does well but if it doesn't do well then the bond holders will first get their money back right until the equity guys will get anything so the bond holders are making a safer investment but at the same time their return is um, lower because it's usually fixed at a certain percentage they don't get the residual claim as the owners do now the second point is this double taxation issue that we have with corporations and this is something i've been talking about since the beginning of this video that corporation is the only business structure we, where we have double taxation so first the corporation it, itself has to pay a corporate tax right so corporate profits are taxed and then once Th that tax is done then when they want to pay the shareholders then again at the individual the dividends are taxed again now let me show you an example let's say we're talking about a french company and they had a net income of 838 million right and they've had to pay a corporate tax on it so their corporate tax is 264 right this will be subtracted and that leaves them with 574 million now again there is a 30 percent income tax on it so when they will give this money to their investors what will happen is that they will have to further pay a 30 percent tax on that which will be approximately 172 point two million right which is again going to be negative as well so they're paying this tax over here the company is paying that and then the investors again are paying so essentially what is happening is that they're paying 264 and 172.2 on this income of 838 and this comes to 52.1 percent so what is their effective tax rate it is 52 point one percent which is quite high right so their effective tax rate is 52.1 because first they paid this tax at the corporate level and then they, they paid this tax at a personal level this by the way is not the situation with sole proprietorship or general partnership or limited partnership because in that situation you only have to pay the personal tax you have no corporate tax in the sole proprietorship or the general partnership or the limited partnership this is only the case with a corporation that first you have to pay the corporate profit tax and then you have to pay the personal tax as well in majority of the countries some countries by the way allow you to not have to pay the individual tax if you've paid the corporate tax but that depends on country to country let's do some more questions which of the following are shared similarities among the four major business structures so we're looking for similarities between sole proprietorship general partnership limited partnership and corporation let's read it one by one sole proprietorships and general partnerships lack legal identity yes this is true the only business structure which has a separate legal identity is a corporation so sole proprietorships and general partnerships definitely lack legal identities this is a correct statement next corporate shareholders and general partners have limited liability corporate shareholders do have limited liability because a corporation is separate from its owners and 
the liability of the corporation cannot go to their owners right so they do have a limited liability which is limited to the extent of the investment they have done but that is not true for general partners general partners unfortunately have unlimited unlimited liability right and this is something we have discussed that even though their limited partners have limited liability but the general partners have unlimited liability and therefore this is a false statement and the last one the taxation of sole proprietorships and limited partnerships is comparable yes the taxation of sole proprietorships limited partnerships and even general partnerships is comparable because they all are taxed once but the corporation is taxed twice right uh, so this is also a true statement next state one condition that would make a corporation subject to a regulatory's jurisdiction so not one let's talk about three wherever you're born or wherever the company is born so where it's registered registered number one number two where it's doing its business so for example i was born in the u.s for instance and if i move to the uk then i have to abide by american laws i have to abide by british laws so just like that for a company wherever it's registered wherever it is doing business now and wherever its securities are listed so if they list them on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange or the Frankfurt or Paris Stock Exchange, then they need to abide by those laws as well. Right. So there are three points you can give anyone to satisfy this question. And one last question, true or false, a primary advantage of the separation of ownership from the control is that improves management by preventing conflicts oh nice question so see if let's say for example you have a sole proprietorship and you are the owner and you are the manager so i mean you can take care of yourself there's not going to be any conflict but then you grow into a big company and you are the owner now and you hire people to work for you right all the time you're going to be worrying are they doing what's best for me or what's best for them and they're going to be thinking what should we do right so when you have this separation does it prevent conflicts no it does not prevent it actually creates this conflict and then you have to do something called corporate governance and a lot of things like you have to incentivize them by giving them stock options and i don't want to go into the details of all that corporate governance of how you kind of align the interest of all the different stakeholders but one thing that i want to tell you over here that the separation does not prevent the conflict it actually gives rise to the conflict because now there are different stakeholders and you have to balance their interest and align their interests so they all work towards the common goal. So this statement is false. Oh, there is one more question. What is the primary distinction between corporate bondholders and corporate shareholders? So this is easy. Shareholders, number one, get voting rights. Right? In the sense that they can sit on the board and control the company. The bondholders get no voting rights. They are not owners. They do not have any control over the board. Number two, these guys have like a fixed return, the bondholders, because uh, they are not taking a part in the risk of the business, uh, which means the shareholders, even though they have a f higher risk, but they can have an unlimited return because they have a residual claim. So whatever the money is left after paying the bondholders, it goes to the shareholders, which could be a lot or it could be uh, nothing at all because if nothing is left, then they will not get anything. So the bondholders have a lower risk, whereas the shareholders have a higher risk. Right. And that is it for this first video. In the second video, we're going to discuss the differences between public and private corporations.